Hello and welcome to the Geotape Lecture Series. It's my pleasure today to welcome Catherine Hess of the APFL in Lausanne, who will talk, tell us about topological exploration of neuronal network dynamics. Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Dewitt. And I'd like to uh, thank my fellow organizers of the seminar for having uh, invited me to give a talk here in the seminar. So today I'm going to talk about how we can use tools from algebraic topology to study the dynamics of activity in networks of neurons. Now, it turns out that topology provides all sorts of useful and revealing dimensionality reduction tools that you can use to apply to neuroscientific data. Other kinds of mathematics have clearly already provided, proved their utility for studying uh, dynamics in networks of neurons, and I'm sure there are other kinds, new kinds of mathematics that one hasn't tried yet. But today I'm going to talk about <clears throat> excuse me, two different ways we can use topology to analyze neural network dynamics. So the thing about neural network dynamics is that they're extremely complicated. So here actually an artificially reconstructed network of neurons. And you can see that after a stimulus, there's a sort of wave of activity that spreads across this sort of complicated and beautiful tapestry of neuronal firing, of changes in action potentials, and so on. And it's, it's really complex to study. So one thing one does is to maybe just make a very simple point neuron simplification, where you consider each neuron just to be a little point that it can uh, that communicates with other neurons in sort of a mysterious abstract way. And you can, it's by simplifying the model, you can understand a bit better what's going on. And that's the kind of thing that we're going to study, at least in the first part of this talk. And in the second part of the talk, I'll go back to the previous picture and say something about how we can use the tools reading topology and network analysis to say things about dynamics from another point of view. So why would you care about studying neural dynamics? Well, of course, we're, we're humans, we'd like to understand things about how our brains work. But more specifically, one thing you'd like to understand is how the brain actually processes information. And one way to understand information processing is to sort of be able to measure and analyze the activity that's going on in the network of neurons. I mean, the, there is some, some people believe that if you want to think about, <clears throat> excuse me, memories or knowledge that has actually been learned by a network, then what you're looking for is sort of an attractor in the dynamics or something like this. Or another thing, reason you might want to study neural dynamics is that, in fact, the neural systems, a particular neural system in the brain, can play multiple roles. So for example, the hippocampus is responsible for both navigation in space and for memory. So it's playing two different roles there. And it's, these different roles are characterized by different activity patterns. And so if you could say something about, by, by looking at the activity of the hippocampus, and you could sort of just by looking at the activity, determine whether or not the hippocampus is currently being used more for memory or more for navigation. That's the kind of thing you might want to be able to do. And then also it turns out that certain neurological disorders, many of which are very important these days, such as Alzheimer's disease and so on, are characterized by particularly abnormal dynamics. And so you would like for example, if you could have a, a magical machine that by measuring the activity in the brain could say, oh, you know, because we've shifted the power spectrum toward lower frequencies and so on, that this must be Alzheimer's disease, some sort of automatic classification system like this for determining what sort of neurological disorder somebody had, that could be particularly useful. So there are many good reasons to study neural dynamics. And what I'm going to show today is two different ways we can approach their study using the tools of algebraic topology. Now, because I'm assuming that the people who are listening to this talk are primarily mathematicians, in particular topologists, and not neuroscientists, I need to give you a little tiny lesson in neurobiology so we at least have a bit of common language in order to discuss uh, what we mean by dynamics and how these dynamics actually are implemented. So, Signal transmission in a network of neurons is by what they call spiking. So if we look at the slide here, we have Let's see if I can use my, oh no, sorry. Okay, I can't use my cursor. But it, on the uh, left-hand part of the picture, we have a neuron where you see its cell body, which is the yellow part. And it has all these little finger things sticking off of it, which are the dendrites. The so dendrites are where the neuron receives information from other neurons. And the, as, the, as it gathers information the, the, from the other neurons, the potential of them on the membrane is rising till it reaches a certain 
threshold point, and then it will emit what's called an action potential, an electrical spike that is transmitted along the axon, in the what's called, as you can see, there's a signal direction along the axon to the dendrites of other neurons. So we have on the left hand, a presynaptic cell. Yeah, any questions? On the right hand, uh, postsynaptic cell, we call this pre and postsynaptic because the connection point between the axon of the first neuron and the dendrite of the second neuron are these synapse points. So these are the meeting points between the axons and the dendrites. And these are the points through which the signal is transmitted from one neuron to another. If you can look at the top of the picture, there we have a cartoon of what is happening at a synapse when these neurotransmitters are actually transmitting the signal uh, via ion transmission from one neuron to another. And with this ion transmission, it then causes the membrane potential of the postsynaptic cell to start to rise, and then it starts to prepare to emit uh, one of these action potentials or spikes as well. So there's this transmission of spikes that is the way that, one, that neurons are communicating, by sending these spikes along the axon to the dendrite of the next neuron in the chain. So that's the very, very elementary introduction to uh, to neuroscience and neurobiology that we'll need today. So I'm now going to introduce one approach to analyzing the dynamics in a network of neurons using the tools of persistent homology. So this is a project, it was actually the master project of an EPFL student named Jean-Baptiste Bardin, who was supervised primarily by my postdoc, Gerd Spreeman. And so we worked together on seeing how we could use persistent homology to analyze dynamics in a network of neurons. So our goals were as follows. We wanted to develop a tool for automated classification of network dynamics, just using the tools of topological data analysis. So the idea was to try to combine topological data analysis and some basic machine learning to be able to say, OK, when I see spiking patterns like this of the neurons, then I'm in this particular dynamic regime. And when you're doing this kind of a classification, so we're going to be looking at synthetic data here. So this is actually simulated data on an artificial network of neurons. And so we can record all of the spiking data from the neurons. And then in order to come up with some sort of appropriate distance or similarity measure between the neurons, there, there are a number of ways you can go about this. And one thing I'm going to talk about is the influence of which particular similarity measure you choose on the results you get in terms of uh, the classification that you want to do. And it shows that we were surprised by how strong the influence of the choice of the similarity measure could be on this particular analysis. So let me explain the workflow, and then I'll go back in detail and discuss some of the more subtle points here, particularly the ones that are not necessarily so familiar to uh, topologists. The first one is that we're going to construct three different artificial networks of what are called leaky integrate and fire, LIF neurons. I'm going to say more about how, what these LIF neurons are. So these are particularly simple mathematical models for actual neurons that makes the, the computation easier. And we're going to, for these networks, we're going to vary the density of connectivity. So how, how many, uh, what the probability of connection is between the neurons how quickly signals are transmitted, what they call synaptic delay, and synaptic strength is how strong the transmitted signals are. Because if a connection is very weak, then you know you can transmit a spike, but it doesn't, it doesn't cause the uh, membrane potential of the next neuron to rise quite as much. So you have these, these different variables we're going to play with, which is going to lead us to different kinds of networks that behave differently. And then what we're going to do is, once we've built these networks, we're going to simulate activity in these networks. And there are going to be various parameters we can play with when we simulate activity. And we're going to see how do the neurons, what is the spiking behavior of the neurons like? And it's going to turn out that each of these networks exhibits different dynamic regimes. And our goal is going to be to just use very simple topological invariants to classify these dynamic regimes. The way we're going to do that is that for each of these uh, in each case, what we're going to be able to do is associate to each simulation of activity a weighted graph. And once we have a weighted graph, then of course we can apply the tools of topological data analysis, in particular persistent homology, to give us various uh, topological invariants. And we're going to 
build these weighted graphs using three different notions of similarity in the, uh, between the behavior of the neurons. And as I said, then we're going to have persistent homology because the weighted graphs give rise to filtered simplicial complexes, and then we're in business. We have the, we have the tools that we need in order to attack this problem. It's going to turn out that it's actually on particularly simple features that we're going to be able to use, that we're going to be extracting from the persistent homology, that we'll then be able to use in combination with very fairly elementary machine learning, train a classifier that will actually predict very well the global network dynamics from these particularly simple features. So now I want to go back and talk about what these artificial networks are and go into a little more detail so we understand exactly what it is we're studying. So what we'll be looking at is a variant of a very famous model for artificial networks of neurons, um, originally created by Brunel, so it's called Brunel Network. So what we'll have is n artificial neurons, and we'll see what kind of n's we take, but they're on, on the order of thousands. And we're going to model their electrophysiology, so their spiking behavior, as, as I said, leaky integrate and fire uh, neurons. And 80% of them will be what's called excitatory, so those are the ones that are kind of amplifying the signal, and 20% of them will be what we call inhibitory, which means they're sort of more damping down the signal in the network. And these proportions, 80% excitatory, 20% inhibitory, these are essentially what you would find in a mamal mammalian brain. You would have also 80 to 90% of excitatory neurons and 10 to 20% of inhibitory neurons. So they're basically just these two types. So as if we go back to the uh, basic neurobiology slide that I talked about a few minutes ago. So we said that, that, that you could have the presynaptic neuron that would go, emit a spike, it would be transmitted along the axon to the dendrite of the next neuron, and that this is supposed to cause a change in the membrane potential of the postsynaptic neuron. And so one thing that's built into this, uh, the mathematics of the Brunel network, is what change occurs in the membrane potential of the postsynaptic neuron as when it receives a spike from the presynaptic neuron. So the one thing to take into account is that things don't happen instantaneously because axons have a certain length. We're not working with electricity here. This is a, the, this is a, um, a chemical uh, electrical signal. This is actually ions that are moving along. So there's really a time delay that's involved in the transmission of the signal. So one of the important parameters in the model is this delay, D, after which there is some change in the membrane potential. So we have to see what happens when we have either excitatory and inhibitory synapses. So when you have an excitatory neuron, then it, it changes, it increases, it, sorry, it induces an increase in the membrane potential of some parameter that we call G, J, sorry. So of course, in a real network of neurons, if you have the, the potential increase caused by a spike by, through an excitatory neuron is not constant, it's something that's going to vary between different types of neurons or even the state of a particular neuron and so on. So this is a very simplified model. We assume that excitatory neurons always cause the same increase in the membrane potential. And the inhibitory ones cause a decrease that's some multiple of, uh, greater than one, of the increase that you would get from an excitatory neuron. So we have an increase of J or a decrease of minus JG. So those are the parameters that we take into account. And then we think, okay, well, what a, the last thing we need to take into account is what sort of uh, connection probability we have, what co connectivity density we have in this network. And so we, we're going to say, well, how many, from how many neurons does each neuron receive inputs? So we have a total of capital N neurons, and some fraction of those are going to feed signals to each neuron. And so we'll say, we'll fix this fraction for everywhere in the network, it's going to be some p between 0 and 1, so that every neuron will receive p times n inputs from the other neurons. So these are the parameters that we're considering. Okay, everything good? And then there's one more factor we have to take into account, which is the rate of external input compared to the rate of internal input. So in order to get this network moving, if you don't have any external input, it's just going to sit there. It's not really going to do anything. It's not going to be the spontaneous firing. So you have some rate of external input, which is this new ext, 
And then there's a rate of internal input, which is uh, nu theta. And the ratio of external to internal input is also an important factor to take into account. The parameters that we're going to play with when we sort of vary the network are going to be this factor G, which is the ratio of the membrane potential increase for excitatory neurons compared to the decrease for inhibitory neurons, and this uh, ratio of the rate of external input to the rate of internal input. So these are the basic elements that we have for our network. So here's a summary of the parameters we take into account and the values that we're using in our case. So we have a total of 2,500 neurons, which is smaller than the original Brunel network. So Brunel, when he made his network, had about 12,000 neurons, if I remember correctly. But that turned out to uh, lead to computational difficulties for us. Maybe with the newer methods for computing persistent homology that we have now compared to a couple years ago, we might be able to deal with a bigger network. But in any case, we, we re restricted a little bit here. So we're considering 2,000 excitatory neurons and 500 inhibitory. So those are the ratios of 80 to 20 percent, again. And then we have a certain number of excitatory synapses per neuron, which uh, is going to be anywhere from 200 to 800. A certain number of inhibitory synapses per neuron, anywhere between 50 and 200. So this is going to depend on the P that we chose, so the fraction of other neurons that provide input to uh, a given neuron. We have this value J, the synaptic strength. So this is the, uh, the value that is measuring how the membrane potential increases after a spike from an excitatory synapse. The synaptic delay, so that's how long it takes a signal to be transmitted the, uh, along an axon, which is this value D. It's also going to vary. So we have uh, different versions that we will consider. And again, in a real life network of neurons, the synaptic delay varies quite a lot depending on axon length, depending on neuron type, and so on. So this is a real simplification to consider a constant synaptic delay. Then you have this uh, factor of little g, which is going to be this ratio between the effect of excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And then this ratio of the external rate of, uh, to the internal rate. And so these last two parameters are the ones that we're going to really vary in our networks. OK, so what do we do now? We consider three different test networks. So the first one is one that has relatively sparse connectivity. So this is this p-value, which is 10%, which means that in our case, each neuron will, have, will receive connections from 10% of all the other neurons. In this case, this would be 250 other neurons. Then we're going to take a time delay, this factor D, of 1.5 milliseconds. So when you're on the scale of uh, neural behavior, where you're really, in terms of time, you're looking on the order of milliseconds. So this is why it's 1.5 milliseconds here. And this is relatively fast, biologically speaking. And then J, which is the increase in membrane potential that you get after a spiking, we're going to take to be 0.1 millivolts. Again, on the level, we're on this micro level of individual neurons, the kinds of potentials that you get are on the order of millivolts. So this is fast, but relatively weak. Another net test network that we're going to use is relatively densely connected, P equals 40%, so that um, each neuron would get receive input from 40% of the other neurons will still have a relatively fast synaptic transmission, so the delay is 1.5 milliseconds. And it's a relatively strong transmission. You notice that J is now 0.2 instead of 0.1 millivolts. And the third version that we consider is relatively dense connectivity, again, the same as above. The time delay is twice as long, so this is a slow synaptic transmission, and strong, 0.2 millivolts again. So we see that we're going to look at various combinations of these different parameters and see how they behave differently in our context. So what are the experiments that we ran with these three networks? So for each of these three networks, we ran 280 simulations of 20 seconds of biological activity. 20 seconds may not sound like a long time, but when you think that uh, activity in, for neurons is on the scale of milliseconds, a lot can happen in a network of neurons in 20 seconds. And then what we did was vary these parameters that are G, which is this relative, uh, the relative synaptic efficacy between excitatory and inhibitory neurons, and the 
the external, uh, the ratio of the external to internal rate. And so it took uh, integer values between 2 and 8 for G. These are sort of standard values that one would consider. This is a, G is a sort of conductance that we're thinking about. And then integer values between 1 and 4 for this relative rate of transmission. And we performed 10 trials of each of these pairs of activity. So then we're looking at our 2,500 neurons, and you can record the times at which each of these neurons spiked, and also the overall firing rate of the neurons during these 20 seconds of activity. And you did this for all of the 280 simulations for each of the networks. And just in passing, because I think I already even used this term, if you look at the time series of spikes of a neuron, it's what's called a spike train. This is standard uh, neuroscience terminology. And so this is just a time series of when the neuron is actually spiking. And it's these sorts of time series that we're going to compare in order to come up with notions of similarity or distance between different neurons. So when we carried out these experiments, we discovered that there were, in fact, four distinct dynamic regimes that appeared. So the first one we called synchronous regular. And you see that, so above, in the, to in the top part of panel A, it's labeled neurons. And these little dashed lines are showing, so each, each uh, horizontal line there represents one neuron. Every time there's a tick in a horizontal line, that means that the neuron is spiking. So it's emitting one of these action potentials. And so going down along the vertically where it says neurons, so you have one horizontal line of spikes and spike times for each neuron. So it's what's called a raster plot. And then below, we have the firing rate. It's like what proportion of the population is actually firing at each particular time. So as you go along the x-axis, you're going in time from 1,000 to 1,100 milliseconds. And if you look just below this panel, it's, we see that this is a particular example where we've chosen G to be equal to 2 and the external rate to be three times the internal rate. So in this case, what we see is that the neurons are basically, they're in clusters that are firing together. They're really highly, highly synchronized. So sort of like high frequency oscillators. So this is one regime that appeared in many of the networks. But you can also have something that's synchronous but irregular. And so that's for a different choice of G and of the external rate compared to the internal rate. And in this case, again, above we have a raster plot where each horizontal line indicates the time series of firing of different neurons. And below, you're looking at the firing rate of the whole population. Again, in this case, it's over a longer time span from 1,000 to 1,500 milliseconds. And you see these peaks in activity of the population. If you look above where you have the peaks, you can see that indeed above each of those peaks, you have a lot of neurons that were firing at that particular time. So the, the lower part of the plot is really just summarizing, taking the sum of all of the ticks above. So in this case, you have a slow oscillatory pattern, and it's synchronous, but it's, n it's not very regular. Sometimes there are a lot of them that are firing together, sometimes just a few, and it's a, but it's, it, is more syn it is still fairly synchronous. The third regime that we saw is the asynchronous and irregular. It's like there's, there's not really much of a pattern to see here, except there's at any one moment there are a lot of neurons that are firing, but it's never the same ones, and it's just the, it's fairly chaotic. Again, this is for yet another choice of G and the relative rate. And the last regime was when we called alternative because it was sometimes alternating between silence and then periods of rapid firing. So if you look at the raster plot, you see these gaps where there's very little going on and then other periods where there's like all the neurons are firing like crazy. And so this was another sort of dynamic regime that we could see. So, we can look at each of the three networks and see where these different regimes are represented. So in these diagrams I'm going to show you, the blue represents the synchronous regular regime, a, the green represents the um, asynchronous regular regime, and uh, the yellow the synchronous irregular, and the red is this alternate regime. So what we see is that A, B, and C are my three different networks, and none of the networks exhibits all four of these dynamic regimes, where you have gray in the diagrams, there just was no firing activity whatsoever. So there just was, there was no regime at all. And you can see that the three networks exhibit 
a different structure of the dynamic regime. So what we're plotting here is the possible values of G versus the possible values of this ratio of external to internal rates. And we see that we get, depending on the pair of G and this ratio that we get, we're landing in different dynamic regimes. So in each case, we're in this synchronous regular regime for small G and basically any uh, any ratio of the external to internal rates, but then things get more complicated when G is bigger. So what we'd like to do is for each of these networks to be able to predict their dynamic regime. So what are we going to do? Well, we have now 280 simulations for each of the networks, and to each simulation we can associate three weighted complete graphs with one node for each neuron. So we're going to have an all-to-all connected graph. And the weights are going to give it in three different ways, either by Pearson correlation of the spike trains, or by two other measures, or one min minus the Pearson correlation, or one minus other notions of correlation between spike trains that are neuro neuroscientifically relevant, that are called spike synchronicity and spike distance. And I'm going to say a few words about what those actually mean. So for the Pearson correlation, why is this something that we might consider in this context? Well, it's known that Pearson correlation is good for encoding the purity of sounds in auditory cortex, at least for the marmoset. And it's often used, in fact, to infer connectivity in, um, in these sorts of neuroscientific situations, also in, in particular when people are talking about fMRI or something like that. And then there's something called the uh, correlation population coding hypothesis, which is kind of controversial in neuroscience, I believe, that uh, seems to be related to Pearson correlation and seems to be a reason not to consider this for dynamic re regimes. This is not something I understand very well. It was just like uh, a warning that we received from neuroscientists that be careful, this might not be the right thing to think about. But it does seem to be some perhaps relevant. So it's some, and it's something that people often consider when they're comparing time series. Then there are two other notions of, that are quite reasonable from a neuroscientific point of view for comparing spike trains. One is to allow you to sort of change the size of your time window because, you know, when the, when the firing rate is higher, you probably want to be considering a sh shorter time window. When the firing rate is lower, perhaps a longer time window. And so that's where these notions come in. So one of them is measuring the fraction of co-fired spikes, so spikes that are fired at the same time in this time window, the size of which depends on your firing rate. And the other of which is just some sort of average over time of uh, dissimilarity profile between the spike trains. So I'm not going to go into details of how these are defined, but just give an example to show how different these three different measures of similarity can be. So here we have two toy models of spike trains for two different neurons. We have a tiny little raster plot over time on the x-axis. And so we want to see, well, how highly, think, how highly are these correlated? Pearson correlation would say they're not very highly correlated. Spike synchronicity says, oh, they look pretty highly correlated, and spike distance is somewhere in the middle. So they're really picking up different aspects of the correlation of these particular time series. And so it's an open question, which should be the right one to consider when we want to associate a weight to the edge of the graph. So we're gonna, we have this graph, the nodes of which correspond to all the neurons in our network. And then we want to put some weight on an edge linking two neurons. And which notion of similarity should we choose? Well, we didn't want to choose, so we just used all of them and then tried to see what was working best. Okay, so how are we going to extract topological features in this case? So now, for each of the three networks, we have 280 weighted, weighted graphs coming from the 280 simulations that we did. So we're going to associate to each weighted graph its filtered flag complex. Or another way to say it is you just take the vitoris rips complex of this weighted graph. So for each weighted graph, we now have a filtered simplicial complex where we gradually add in edges depending on the similarity uh, distance increases. And that gives us, uh, we can now apply the tools of topological data analysis, persistent homology. So more specifically, what is the rth uh, simplicial complex in this filtered flag complex? Well, its n simplices are exactly those sets of vertices, such that the weight of each edge is at most r. And then once we have the filtered flag complex, we can compute the associated Betty 0 and Betty 1 curves. So these are going to give us along the interval from 0 to 1, integers. 
as we go along, where the value for r is the uh, Betty zero at r is the dimension of the zeroth homology of f r of g, and Betty one of r is the dimension of h one of f r of g. So we're here. I'm taking uh, f two coefficients. So here's our toy example. We consider a little tiny graph with edges with weights alpha, beta, and gamma, where alpha is less than beta is less than gamma. And if we look here, what do, what do we have when we're at threshold zero? There are only the vertices. None of the edges is included. At threshold alpha, we have the vertical edges that are included. Threshold beta, we have the vertical and horizontal edges. And threshold gamma, we have the edge gamma as well, and which means that we now have two, two simplices, and so the thing gets filled in. So we look what's happening uh, with Betty zero, which is to say the connected components. Then we start with four connected components at threshold zero. Then by, when we get to threshold A, we suddenly have two connected components. We get to threshold B, we drop down to one component, and that stays constant thereafter. If we look at Betty one, at, we don't have any cycles whatsoever until we get to threshold beta. And then when we get to threshold gamma, then that cycle is filled in, and so we have nothing more. So we have these very simple Betty curves. Now, Betty curves seem to you know, collapse so much information about the filtered complex, but it turns out that it actually is telling us quite a lot. Okay, so here's where we were. We have our three times 280 weighted graphs. We have the associated filtered flight complexes. We compute the Betty zero and Betty one curves. And if each curve, for each Betty zero curve, we can compute the area under the curve, and the filtration value, so the R value, at which it starts to decrease. And for each Betty 1 curve, we're going to curve again the area under the curve. And in this case, it's a global maximum. It may seem like we're really extracting a very minimal amount of information about these curves, but it turns out to be sufficient for what we want to do. So what we have in the end, for each simulation, we have 3 times 2 times 2, that is to say 12, features that we've extracted, which seem extremely simple. So if we look at an example of these features, so for the Betty zero curve, we see that we measure the area under the curves, that's the area that's shaded in gray, and then the value at which the curve starts to decrease, which is a little bit before 0 0.2. On the other hand, we have the Betty one curve, and there we look at the area under the curve, so the gray shaded area again, and then the maximum, which is this red value somewhere around uh, maybe 850 or something like that. So those are the sorts of values that we're recording here. We've collapsed all of this complex information to four different simple numerical values. Okay, so what is our classifier? So we chose six of these 12 topological features that the highest mutual information with respect to the different labels, the four labels of the different dynamic regimes. This turns out to be the area under the Betty zero curve for each of the three similarity measures, and the area under the Betty one curve for Pearson correlation and for spike synchronicity, so we two of the three, and the maximum of the Betty one curve for a spike distance. So it turns out to be extremely useful for us to have worked with three different notions of similarity because that gives us access to three, you know, three different uh, weighted graphs and therefore three different sets of is very simple topological invariance, and it turns out that by using ones that are associated to different similarity measures, we extract more information. And then we train a support vector machine on these features. So we use uh, training sets that are composed of randomly selected simulations from a specific network version, and then some union of those. And then we choose four different subclassifiers, one for each of the regimes to be classified and then did the final classification using a one versus rest technique. And then I'm not going to say anything about the regular, there was some regularizing hyperparameter that uh, was there just to make sure that everything was done correctly. And uh, we could be that we could have, might have used only a linear classifier instead of a support vector machine, but uh, for some reason we just started in the direction of support vector machines and they worked very well. So what can we say about the classification accuracy? So that was how we trained the network, how do we test it? So we had three test sets, one composed of 10% of the samples from the version not used for training, 
and two containing all the valid samples from one of the other versions, other versions of the network. So because not all the regimes are represented in all of the versions, we had to sometimes be careful about which samples we actually chose in that context. And you can also combine the samples from all three of the versions and then assess the accuracy. And it turns out that the accuracy is indeed very high, that if we look at on the, this plot, this table here is showing us the accuracy based on the training set versus the testing set. And we see that when we train the classifier on version N and then test it on version N, we get 100% classification, which is maybe not too surprising, but it's nice to see that if we train it on version one, for example, we also get decent classification on version two and version three. And actually, if we train on version three, then we get excellent class for classification as well in version one and version two. So it's, it's looking quite well, and if we train it on all the versions, then we get very good classification in all of the versions. So, the distances, the different distances we chose give us different information. So we could see what we could do better if we could take the features coming from just one notion of similarity or from all the notions of similarity. And it turns out that if we just restrict to one notion of similarity, Pearson correlation doesn't actually do that well. It's this measure of spike synchronicity that does best. And spike distance is roughly comparable to, to the Pearson correlation. But the main point is that combining features from different similarity measures led to the best performance of all. Okay, I think that going to, let's see. Yeah, and so these six features that we selected based on mutual information were actually chosen by I at first, had the very best accuracy, even better than using all 12 of the features. So we can just look at for one example, classifier accuracy when you're trained on version one. So here, the different columns here, there, so we have accuracy, accuracy on each of the versions. This is the legend on the right. And for our selected features, for those features coming from Pearson correlation, from those features coming from the spike synchronization, the other one is the spike distance, or when you use all of the distances. And what you see is that our selected features give us the best results on all of the versions. So I'm going to just go skip quickly through these. We don't need to see all of the examples. And this is an illustration of how we use mutual information to find these features, but I think that that's a little bit too technical for right now. Let me just go to the conclusions here for this part. It turns out that we can actually perfectly predict these network regimes from a few features that are extracted from persistent homology. Very elementary features, just area under the curve, maximum, where it starts decreasing, things like this, which was almost which was quite surprising to me at first. And you can even, you can predict the dynamics on a network on which you were not trained. Uh, so you can train the classifier on one network and test it on an, a different network and you still get high accuracy. So there's something very robust about this particular classifier. And also the importance of using different spike train similarities to maximize performance. So just a couple ideas for future work, including work that is currently in progress. I mean, this is not entirely satisfactory to do uh, analysis like this on synthetic data. It's, it's somehow cheating. It's too easy. This, is, this, is, this data is too clean, not noisy enough to compare with biological data. And we are actually testing this same method on true biological data coming from uh, freely behaving mice that uh, are either of wild type or have some sort of mouse, mouse version of, um, of uh, autism, if you will and just seeing whether we can detect different dynamic regimes in their brains, and it's, a good, it's off to a good start. You could also try other types of neural data, such as a population firing rate or neuron voltage traces. And we'd really like to develop more of an unsupervised version of this method, because this was a supervised method, so that you could actually use this for real-time detection of previously unknown dynamic regimes. And so what we'd also like to do is to compare the performance of this to other things sort of like simply simplex counts and other measures that one can associate to a filtered complex. So I think it's a good point to break now to see if there are any questions because I'm going to switch and talk about another approach to dynamics in just a moment. So I'd be happy to take any questions now if there are any. Kevin, can you say again what the filtration parameter R is? Right, so we have three different notions of similarity. 
that we consider between the neurons. And we can use those three different notions of similarity to give us weights on the edges of a graph. So we associate to the network a graph, the nodes of which correspond to the neurons. The edges are, so I just have a complete graph, I have an edge between every pair of neurons, and then I have a weight on the edge that's given by one of these three measures of similarity. And as I do build this filtered complex, I will include at, at filtration R, I will include all those edges of weight less than or equal to R. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what's going on in that filtration. So I'm making a bigger and bigger and bigger complex that way, taking into account. Uh, so at first I consider when R is very small, I have only neurons that are very similar, whose, whose spiking behavior is very similar. And then as I grow, I'm allowing myself to include edges between neurons that are less similar as I, as I go up in the filtration. What dimension superficial complexes do you get this way? Uh, I don't know how big the superficial complexes actually are. They're probably enormous. And, but it, in the end, all we needed to look at was the uh, zero and one dimensional homology. So, but probably, in fact, the superficial complexes are enormous. And we tried as well looking at sort of the higher uh, dimensional data as well, Betty 2, Betty 3. But it um, was much harder to compute and didn't add anything to the accuracy of the classifier, so we dropped it. Okay. If there are no further questions, I'll talk about a complementary approach to looking at dynamics. So this is work uh, with collaborators primarily from the Blue Brain Project, Michael Ryman, Max Nolte, Martina Scolamiro was one of my postdocs at the time, Kate Turner as well. Rodrigo Perrin works in a wet lab at the EPFL. Giuseppe Kindemi is also at uh, Blue Brain. Pavel Lotko, who's currently in Swansea, Ron Levy in Aberdeen, and Henry Markram, who is the founder of the Blue Brain Project. So we're going to take a different approach to thinking about network dynamics, really a network kind of approach, uh, not using persistence, but using definitely homology. So when you're thinking about two neurons and how they're related, the connections between them are definitely directed. We're thinking about a flow of information from a presynaptic to a postsynaptic neuron transmitted along the axon to the dendrite. And the synapses, you can think of them as sort of valves or one-way roads, if you will. The information is very much flowing in one direction. So we want to represent the entire circuit of neurons by a directed graph, by a digraph. And when we want to go from networks to topology, you know, one way, the, a, a good way to do this is to say, okay, I want to study a very large, very large network usually, and one way to do so is to say, well, I'm going to look how to break it up into sort of significant sub-networks, which neuroscientists often call motifs. And we want to look at how those different sub-networks, how many there are within the network, how they overlap, and how they create more complex structures within the graph itself. And so if you're just counting how many of each different type of network you have, it's giving you sort of important local information about the network. Whereas if you figure out how these different sub-networks are overlapping, that's giving you more global information about the structure of the network. So in the case of directed and unweighted graphs, which is how the representation that we're going to be considering of a network of neurons, then, so we start with G, which is some directed graph. And we're going to consider as the specific motifs or significant subnetworks that interest us ones that we call directed n simplices. So these are going to be complete acyclic subgraphs on n plus one vertices. So if we look at what that means, a directed zero simplex is just a node of the graph, a vertex. A directed one simplex is just a directed edge. A directed two simplex is a little feed forward network on three neurons. So the idea here with focusing on these directed end simplices is you're thinking about feed forward pieces of your network that should all be working together to transmit information further. So we take a feed forward piece like this. This is a directed two simplex. A directed three simplex, we have four neurons that are all to all connected where there is a source that's in the upper left hand corner. We have a sink which is in the middle here and that uh, it is, it's an acyclic subgraph on these four vertices. And so once we have a digraph like that, and we decide to focus on these simplices, we can build what are called directed flag complexes, which is very similar to the flag complexes one usually studies for undirected graphs. 
So it's an ordered simplicial complex, which is just really means we have a collection of ordered sets or a collection of lists, closed undertaking sublists. That's the collection of all directed n simplices of the graph for all n. And so the zero simplices, then, and so it gives us we have an actual uh, graded set now where what we have in degree n are the all the directed n simplices. And it's important to observe that to each directed n simplex, we can associate n plus 1 directed n minus 1 simplices, which we get by eliminating one of the nodes in the simplex. So if I start with the directed 2 simplex, then I can extract from it three different directed 1 simplices, first by forgetting the node that's the source, then by forgetting the node that's sort of between the source and the sink, and then by forgetting the one that's actually at the sink. So we have three different directed one simplices that we can associate to this directed two simplex. And this generalizes, of course, if, if I just have one of these directed n simplices, I remove one of the nodes, I'm going to get a directed n minus one simplex. And so the point about thinking about the directed flex simplex is that what we're doing is looking at all of these pieces of which the network is built, how they overlap, and they're overlapping. I can say two, I can have two directed n simplices that are overlapping along any simplex of lower dimension. And this is encoded in this idea of how all these, um, about looking at the faces of, of a simplex in this way. Okay, so here's an example. Here's a little tiny uh, directed graph, which has, as you'll see, as you see here, a reciprocal connection. So you can have connections going from A to B and from B to A in my directed graphs. I don't allow loops on one vertex, but you do have reciprocal connections. And if we look, we have, in fact, two two simplices, directed two simplices here, what I get by filling in these, uh, which I indicate by filling in these triangles here. Whereas if you look at the triangle that's in the middle there, so if I'm not thinking about things in a directed way, we have a two simplex, but if I look at what's going on there in the middle, it's actually a cycle. I'm going around and around and around, so it's not one of these directed simpl two simplices, which is a feed forward thing. Same thing if I look at the connections between the three neurons on the right, which include this curved reciprocal connection, I again have a cycle, I don't have a two simplex. So this is how we can build up uh, an ordered simplicial complex from a directed graph in this sense. So what's going on with the cycles is the cycles in the graph are creating homology classes. So we're not ignoring them. In fact, we're giving them additional importance by saying they're, they're there and they're giving us homology. So we're going to use these sort of directed graphs to encode activity now. So what you can do, and what we have done in the case of the blue brain model of the microcircuit of part of the brain of a rat, is you can record neural activity in a network of neurons and so your network of neurons has an underlying structural directed graph, just saying how the neurons are connected to each other. So each neuron is connected to a certain number of other neurons, and you can, by, by these sorts of directed connections, so you have this underlying structural directed graph. And as activity propagates through the network, you can bin the activity to different time bins. And each time bin, you can say, okay, which are the edges that are active? They're actually transmitting a signal from one neuron to another. And so what this gives you is actually a time series of sub digraphs of your structural graph, which is the active part of your graph at that particular time. So you can look at this time series of sub digraphs, and from that you can create time series of all sorts of different topological invariants. So more specifically, what you do is you're going to separate the spikes into, in our case, five millisecond time bins. This turns out to be the right biological time frame to look at. And then form a subgraph of the edges that are active according to some rule that uh, we came up with based on a probabilistic analysis called the transmission response rule. So how does this work? So here we're looking at a small network of neurons. And you can say, in interval n, so we suppose that we actually have a structural connection from neuron J to neuron K. And we'll say that there is a functional connection, that is to say the edge is active, if the presynaptic neuron fires spikes in that interval, and the postsynaptic neuron spikes at most 10 milliseconds, again, this is biologically determined, after neuron J. So we don't, we're not sure about the causation here, but it's 
not impossible or even maybe even likely that neuron J caused neuron K to fire or is part of causing neuron K to fire. And so we can consider that edge to be active in that particular time bin. So this is the way we create a time series of structural graphs. And once we have structural subgraphs, now once we have a time series of subgraphs, then we can associate to it a time series of different sorts of topological invariants because once you have a subgraph, you can associate to it its directed flight complex, its ordered simplicial complex, and then you can compute its homology, you can compute its Betty numbers, you can compute its Euler characteristic and all these different values. So the next time I'm going to show you is an example of different time series of different topological invariants. So we ran an experiment using the digital re digitally reconstructed microcircuit at the Blue Brain project with nine different stimuli, which are indicated here by the nine different colors from S5ABC to S30ABC. So these were nine different input stimuli that we, uh, we used for this network. And then we recorded the activity and then binned the activity in these different time bins, found the active subgraphs in each time bin, and then computed these invariants for each time bin. And what you see is that, so we're looking there at where it says 1D, those are the edges in the graph, B1 is the first Betty number, B3 is the third Betty number, EC is Euler characteristic, and we're looking along the x-axis at what's happening through time for these nine different stimuli. And what you see is that, for example, the Euler characteristic seems to do for a, a pretty good job of distinguishing at least between the three classes of stimuli. So the three classes of stimuli are more a question of the, uh, the synchronization of the firing of the input stimuli. And also the Betty 3, for example, seems to see detect pretty well the differences between these different stimuli. But this is just sort of like eyeballing it. We, this, isn't, this isn't statistically significant. What we're saying here is just some indication that these topological invariants are detecting something about the activity in the network. So let's try a little harder to quantify this. So we decided to do the following thing. So we chose three of the stimuli, S5b, S15b, S30b, and we plotted through time the Betty 1 versus Betty 3. Seems like kind of a crazy thing to do, but it turns out that looking at these Betty numbers actually is um, it's a, a very strong dimensionality reduction, but that actually picks up important structure. So let me explain something about this plot that we're looking at here, despite in addition to the fact that it's simply, I think, uh, beautiful to look at. But what we're looking at is if you look, if you see the sort of dotted curve that's going around the pink figure, you see that it says 65 to 70 milliseconds, 70 to 75, 75 to 80, 80 to 85, and so on. So as time is moving forward, we're, we're sort of plotting Betty 1 versus Betty 3, sort of collapsing a three-dimensional graph into plot into two dimensions here. And what we see is that as time is passing, and as we move from one time bin to another, or one uh, active subgraph to another, the first Betty 1 increases, 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 and then at some point it starts decreasing, and Betty 3 starts increasing. It's sort of, sort of like filling in the one-dimensional cavities. And from those, and higher dimensional, two-dimensional two cavities, you're sort of building all of a sudden these three-dimensional homology classes. And so the complexity of the subgraph as measured by its Betty numbers increases and increases and increases till some sort of maximum, and then it suddenly all dies away. And the interesting thing is that not only do you get this sort of topological signature of information processing for one of these stimuli, it actually works for all three of them. So again, the S S5b is a very synchronous stimulus, so it's a very powerful stimulus, so you get a very strong signature. Um, the 15 and 30 cases are less synchronous and a bit less strong, so you don't get quite the same, uh, quite as big a response, but you have the same shape of the response, that the, you get an increase in Betty 1, and then, you, then when it starts dying down, you get an increase in Betty 3, and then it all collapses. And so you have this sort of consistent topological signature that is even consistent across the different stimuli, and also, in addition to being sort of consistent in its general shape, we see that it also enables us to distinguish among the three different stimuli. So that the topology here is picking up something important about how activity is transmitted through the network.
So I wanted to also say that in the case of this, uh, the blue brain digital reconstruction of part of the brain of a rat, they had various um, different sets of biological parameters that they use as input to the reconstruction. And so we have different models of brains of different rats, if you will. And you can see that they, here in this plot, we're saying that even if we use, here we're using the same stimulus in different rat models, that they all had the same basic shape to this topological signature for information processing, just maybe shifted a little bit, not the same amplitude, but always the same kind of pattern of increasing complexity followed by a, sort of a peak after which everything collapsed. And here, this is showing how the, the heat maps here are showing how the information is, is uh, being processed through the circuit. So here we have like a slice in the brain. The top is close to the surface of the brain. They're going down into the deeper layers where it's marked with a Roman numeral six. And this heat map is just showing where the activity is in the network as you go around. So it's really, you can see where the where more complex structures may be concentrated. So this, I mean, it's nothing, this is more a qualitative vision, a qualitative topological signature for information processing, but it's an indication that we can use these sorts of tools of algebraic topology to detect interesting dynamics that even can allow us to distinguish between different stimuli, but we have the same kind of signature sort of independently of sort of biological parameters that we're using or the stimulus that we're considering. So this is just cracking open the door to an interesting approach to studying neural network dynamics using algebraic topology. And with that, I would like to thank everyone for their attention, point out that here are the two articles about which I have been speaking, and I would be happy to answer any more questions if there are any. Catherine, thank you for a very interesting talk. But in, in your last slide, was that experimental data on a real rat brain when you did, looked at it at different levels, those heat maps? So that's not actually a real rat brain. That's from, so the in the Blue Brain Project, they've done a digital reconstruction of part of the brain of a rat. So they take like a core sample from what's called the somatosensory cortex, which is part of the brain that's responsible for processing sensory information where they look at this, so they've reconstructed what would be uh, like this core sample consisting of roughly 31,000 neurons and 8 million connections between them. Whereas the, they built the architecture of it and they, they included the, the electrophysiology of the neurons, much more complex models than the leaky integrate and fire that I was talking about earlier. So they can actually simulate activity in response to stimuli in this digital reconstruction. So this experiment here was an in silico experiment done on this digital reconstruction. How many neurons in the digital reconstruction? 31,000. So more recently they've built another a model of the entire somatosensory cortex that has 1.7 million neurons and we're in the process of analyzing its structure and function using these tools of algebraic topology right now and it's uh, going to lead to some interesting results. And you did different slices so they had different connectivity at each slice? I mean the, the model itself? Uh, so the, the connectivity patterns depend very much on what layer you're in. So these numbers, where it says two, three, down to, down, down to six, these are different layers in cortex. So all mammals have these sort of six distinct layers in cortex. And the cell densities and the cell types and how the connectivity patterns work depends very much on what layer you're in, in the brain. So here, the reconstruction was really done as a, as in, a, uh, in a cylindrical way. So it really is like, like a, taking a core sample from, from the ground or from a tree or something like that. You have this sort of cylindrical core going all the way through the gray matter. So if there are no other questions, we'd like to thank our speaker for a terrific talk. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.